Let's say we own a store and know exactly how much of our best product we'll sell this year. Should we restock our inventory every month? Or twice a month? And what about the costs of these decisions? The Economic Order Quantity EOQ, stands as a cornerstone in operations and supply chain management. This analytical tool is designed to aid organizations in determining the optimal order size that minimizes the total costs associated with inventory, including both holding and ordering expenses. Due to its simplicity and effectiveness, the EOQ model is extensively taught as a core concept in operations and is widely featured in academic literature. It serves as a fundamental strategy for inventory optimization and as a preliminary step towards developing more sophisticated inventory models and policies. In 1913, Ford Whitman Harris, an American production engineer, introduced the EOQ model through his paper, How Many Parts to Make at Once, published in Factory, the Magazine of Management. His work, rooted in a deep understanding of manufacturing and logistics, highlighted the importance of balancing the more apparent costs of ordering inventory in batches or lots, with the more subtle expenses incurred from holding these lots, such as capital interest and depreciation, during their consumption phase. Following the initial publication, various adaptations of the EOQ formula were proposed. However, Harris's fundamental approach remained the standard for order quantity analysis for decades. Let's take a deeper dive into the cost concepts of the basic EOQ model. Whether in the form of raw materials, components, or final products, inventory will be required through a given period. For instance, one year. We will call this time frame the unit time. During this unit time, acquiring and holding inventory, which is gradually depleted, incurs specific costs that are essential for operational continuity. Accordingly, the total cost of inventory consists of Material cost represents the cumulative value of all required items acquired either through procurement or production. It's derived from the unit cost multiplied by the total demand over the unit time. For merchants, the unit cost encompasses the purchase price from suppliers, plus any additional costs necessary for preparing the product for sale, such as packaging and labelling. It often also covers per-unit charges for freight transportation and material handling activities, like loading and unloading. For producers, the unit cost extends beyond the mere calculation of raw materials. It encompasses the total unitary production cost, which includes direct labour and overheads. Notice that there is a crucial assumption here. Demand is represented by a single value, so it's said to be known and constant throughout the year. We will explore the ramifications of this assumption later. Ordering cost, also referred to as setup cost in manufacturing. It is a fixed cost incurred with each batch production or lot purchase. Its defining characteristic in modeling is that it remains constant, irrespective of the lot size queue. Accordingly, the total ordering cost is solely based on the number of replenishments throughout the year. Assuming an annual demand of D units and utilizing a lot size of Q units per order, the total number of orders required throughout the year can be calculated as D over Q. By multiplying this quantity by the setup cost per order, C sub T, we obtain the total setup cost for the year. But what are the fixed costs of ordering inventory? Consider the resources invested in a purchase process, the buyer's time, communication expenses, the use of procurement software. There is also paperwork and invoicing. The transportation of the items might require fixed delivery rates, independent of the lot size. Later, upon arrival, inventory incurs costs before it even hits the shelves. We're talking about material handling, preparation for storage, inspection, and the task of updating inventory records. In practical situations, however, both receiving and transportation costs are influenced by the size of the lot. For instance, handling and transporting large quantities requires more labor than smaller lots. This implies that the ordering cost may have both a fixed and a variable element that escalates with Q. Notice that the Q in the variable component would be cancelled out. 
This is why per unit costs like transportation and material handling were already included in the unit cost. However, this approach assumes that the variable factor does not benefit from economies of scale and remains constant for any lot size. Now, in the context of manufacturing, fixed setup costs can also be multifaceted. For instance, the labour required for machine setup is a critical factor in the early stages of production runs. Reduced efficiency and quality often characterise the learning period for new production setups, representing another significant cost component. Furthermore, when a fully operational factory pauses the production of revenue-generating items for a new setup, substantial opportunity costs arise, highlighting the financial weight of these decisions. Holding cost, also known as carrying cost. Unlike the setup cost, the holding cost is determined based on the quantity or level of inventory ordered or produced in each lot, leading to different holding costs for varying lot sizes. This difference is due to the cost concepts involved here. For instance, the money tied up in inventory or cost of capital. Capital is allocated to either purchase or produce inventory units, so less inventory means more available capital for alternative investments, each with their respective rates of return. Given that capital can be sourced from either equity or debt, the weighted average cost of capital is often used here, as it's a blended measure for both sources of inventory financing. Costs of storage. Warehouse space often represents a significant expenditure, especially in prime locations. Handling and organizing within the storage space adds to the costs. Some inventory items might also necessitate special storage conditions, such as refrigeration or specific humidity levels, leading to additional expenses. Sometimes, concepts such as perishability, shrinkage, insurance, or even taxation expenses are also included as part of the holding cost. Given the complexity of these factors, the EOQ model attempts to combine all these cost concepts into a single value, C sub E, which can be expressed, for instance, as a percentage of the unit value C. This percentage is known as the holding rate. Accordingly, the total holding cost is calculated as C sub E multiplied by the amount of inventory held during the year. So, how much inventory is held during the year? Recall that previously, we stated that demand in the EOQ model is assumed to be constant throughout the year. This can also be interpreted as a steady rate of consumption or usage per unit time. Given this steady rate of consumption, if inventory is ordered in lots of size Q when items are entirely consumed and the new stock is received immediately, the inventory level will naturally fluctuate between Q and zero. Observe that this pattern also requires a continuous demand. There is no point in time in which consumption stops. So, to streamline calculations, the average inventory level is used as the amount held over the year, which is taken as the lot size Q over 2. We are now closer to deriving the square root formula for the EOQ. But first, let's take a closer look at the model's assumptions. We've already established that demand is assumed to be known and constant, rather than variable, and also continuous, indicating an uninterrupted consumption over time. As for replenishment, it's expected to be instantaneous or nearly so. This means that items are received as soon as they're ordered. Items are not subject to quantity-based discounts and don't have specific perishability constraints, allowing for indefinite storage. The planning horizon is considered infinite, which implies that, despite the use of annual costs, the model results in a perpetual policy without a defined time limit. The inventory review system is continuous rather than periodic, enabling checks of inventory levels at any time, with the aim to reorder as soon as a lot is fully consumed. However, given the known, constant and continuous nature of demand, the time for complete depletion is predictable. The model also assumes no explicit restrictions on order size or storage capacity, and back orders are not allowed. Lastly, the model takes for granted that cost parameters, such as unit, setup, and holding costs, are constant over time. Note that we are not considering the potential costs of stockouts or shortages, as the model theoretically mitigates this risk. 
By operating under the premise of constant and known demand, ensuring timely replenishments and disallowing back orders, we effectively negate the possibility of sudden stockouts. It's important to realize that the EOQ model is most effective when these conditions are met, but such scenarios are rare in real-world applications. Fortunately, the model can be modified to accommodate deviations from these assumptions, or we can leverage its insights to develop more advanced models better suited to those complexities. So let's continue with the total inventory cost expression. If we consider the individual costs and the demand as known parameters, and the order quantity Q as a variable, then the total cost of inventory is a function of Q. Note that the material cost remains unaffected by changes in Q and can be seen as a fixed cost in this regard. So, for the purpose of our analysis, we can exclude the material cost and focus solely on the costs that are relevant and influenced by Q. This leads us to the formulation of the total relevant cost expression. Let's plot the function to observe its behavior. As Q increases, the ordering or setup cost decreases, which is logical since larger lots result in fewer orders. Conversely, the holding cost increases with larger Q, leading to a higher average cost for the year and therefore more capital and storage costs as previously discussed. We can visually observe that the total relevant cost appears to be the least when both cost components are roughly equal. To precisely understand this aspect and confirm our visual intuition, a basic understanding of calculus, specifically derivatives, is necessary. An in-depth exploration of derivatives could require multiple videos, so we won't delve into it here. For those unfamiliar with the concept, I recommend 3 Blue One Brown's concise and intuitive series on the essence of calculus. In a nutshell, derivatives help us determine the slope of tangent lines to a function. To minimize the total relevant cost, our focus is on identifying the specific tangent line with a slope of zero, as this indicates the function's minimum point. So, to determine the optimal value of Q that minimizes the total relevant cost, we take the derivative of the cost function with respect to Q and set it equal to zero. This approach locates the precise point where Q yields the minimum cost. Algebraic manipulation of the cost minimization equation reveals the condition where holding and setup costs are equal, providing its mathematical basis. We have successfully derived the well-known square root formula of the EOQ model. Let's work through an example. The Q Pro 10, recognized for being a product with high and consistent market performance, maintains a firmly established annual demand of 10,000 units. Analysts, considering supplier agreements and processing fees, have precisely determined the ordering cost at $950 per order. Furthermore, they have assessed the holding cost, factoring in storage and capital expenses, to be 20% of the unit's acquisition price, established at $125 by the manufacturer. Given these parameters, the optimal order quantity is approximately 872 units. This results in about 11 and a half orders per year. With a consumption rate of 10,000 units per year, the time required to consume the EOQ is approximately 0.0872 years, or about 32 days. Consequently, orders will be placed roughly every 32 days. While not precisely matching due to the rounding of Q, the holding and ordering costs are very close, and together they total $21,794. Now what if we opted to place orders twice a month? So let's say every 15 days. This approach would lead to order sizes of 411 units, and consequently, the total relevant cost would escalate to $28,252, marking an increase of nearly 30%. Now, what if the resulting policy is infeasible due to internal rules or supplier constraints? How do we navigate situations where orders are restricted to 100 unit increments or when order frequency is limited to weeks or months? Certainly, we must accommodate our optimal policy to these real constraints. And what if our estimation of parameters like demand is wrong? How would these differences affect costs? Fortunately, 
If we were to conduct a sensitivity analysis on our EOQ model, we could address these uncertainties. This way, we might come up with a plan that isn't perfect, but one that we could actually use. Note that in the EOQ model, and similarly in all inventory models, cost values are essentially estimations, given that most accounting systems do not report such numbers directly. Therefore, accurate estimation is critical. It is equally important to regularly analyze, refine, and update these estimates to maintain their relevance. The model's effectiveness depends on ensuring that the benefits, specifically cost savings and increased efficiency, outweigh the expenses incurred in data collection and implementation. If the realized savings are insubstantial, resorting to simpler methods like an informed guess based on experience may prove to be more practical. However, in certain situations, the use of more sophisticated models is imperative particularly where the consequences of inefficiencies could be significantly costly. There is still much to explore in inventory models, so stay tuned.